at the first jetty of the base here on the right, called the South Railway Jetty. Gets its name as this used to be as far south as the rail line in Portsmouth it used to extend to. That though was all the way until many years ago, when a rail line of was here was completely removed. Today, the only remaining part of it is the blue front of the building, and to our right, that is the old waiting rooms. But obviously, with the uh, train line now gone, the jetty's instead become the home to the big red roof building in the background, the one with a sort of sandy coloured tower on top of it. The building is known as Semaphore Tower, and it plays home to a group called the Queen's Harbour Master, or QHM for short. And these are the people in charge of all the shipping movements in and around Portsmouth, which go from the start of this tour right up to the means of all the warships, cross shell ferries, Isle of ferries, and also all the yachts and bike boats passing down our left side. Basically, everything that moves around harbour has to go through the people up in that tower first. But as we move along, folks, now moving on to arguably the most important ships in the harbour today. Here on our right, of course, there are two brand new Queen Elizabeth class supercarriers. First of all, the HMS Prince of Wales, followed by her sister ship, the Queen Elizabeth. Now, folks, these are the largest and the most expensive warships ever owned and operated by our Royal Navy. So, after all, they cost a whopping £3.1 billion pounds each. In terms of size of Jeremy with ships, the size is often determined by how heavy they are. And the aircraft carries no exception to this, they both weigh in at around 70,000 pounds. Therefore, on paper, they're both about three times the size of our previous invincible class of aircraft carriers. Although, to be slightly more specific, they're both about 280 metres. Long, 70 metres wide, and it's about 10 metres in the ship, so you can't know what it's like. For the sense purposes, this is about as physically large as possible to get into the port. In fact, any big you seriously struggle to get through the harbour entrance and start running behind us. So, as for the two carriers we have in the Royal Navy, the uh, Prince Wales on our right at the moment, she is the newer one of the two, arrived at the harbour back in 2019, whereas the Queen Elizabeth up in front arrived in 2017. But over the past couple of years, both aircraft carriers have been undergoing a wide variety of training and trials, trying to get themselves ready for what is known as frontline duties. Frontline duties basically the process where the aircraft carriers go to service for the very first time. Now the first one I've only service out of the two of them was the Queen Elizabeth up in front here, she did so last year. Uh, she went off on her first ever deployment around Easter time, spent seven months out at sea. The Prince of Wales on the other hand, well, she entered the service earlier this year. Uh, so basically, early this year she joined um, joined NATO, where she became the lead ship for them, and uh, now whenever NATO needs to deploy an aircraft carrier in the Prince of Wales, they go call it first. Now, as you can go past the Prince of Wales, or as we can go past the Prince of Wales, you might have heard she was making a bit of a racket sat alongside. There's uh, quite a lot of activity taking place on her at the moment, and that's because she's due to depart the harbour tomorrow. Tomorrow lunchtime, about 10 past 12, she is due to pull off the keyboard and she'll be heading out to sea. In fact, she's going across to America to do uh, further flight trials and uh, pick up some more Alpine aircraft as well. So she's getting ready to leave. The noise you can hear is the generators running. She's been taken out off of shore power uh, about a day or two ago. So that noise has been going on for a while now. And like I say, she's due out tomorrow. So if you're in the area at lunchtime tomorrow, you will get the chance to see her leaving. On the other hand, well, she's also due to go soon. Uh, we believe in the next week or two, she's going to go off to uh, the Met. That will mean that we won't have any aircraft carriers in the harbour then until the uh, remainder of the year. Stands for short takeoff and vertical landing. Basically, what it means when the aircraft 
up on a takeoff, they don't need a very long runner. In fact, all they really require is a ski ramp up in the bow, however, coming to land is a completely different ball game. As after all, 280 metres isn't a very long runway. So to avoid touching down at the far end and then walking up the front, they have to land vertically. A lot like Roland Harriet, jump jets used to do on modern day helicopters do now. So we'll come back to the carriage a little bit later. But now we're going past the Peter 82, that's the Peter 7, the past control ship. Being served since about 2003, she generally spends most of her life here in the UK and gets involved in fisheries protection. So it goes around making sure that the fishermen adhere to the rules and regulations. Behind her is then two daring class type of flight destroyers. The third one is up ahead of us as well. So that's the Duncan and Diamond on our right, and then Defender up ahead. The Type 45, they've been around since 2009. At the time of construction, these were the most expensive warships in the Navy, costing in excess of a million pounds each. The prime role for a Type 45 destroyer is for air defence. They are therefore designed to track and find missiles and aircraft in the skies around the fleet. To do so, the ships are quite renowned for carrying what they're probably one of the most powerful and sophisticated missile and aircraft systems fitted to any warship in the world. Most notably is the big grey ball up on the top of the corner's mast. That is the Samson multi-functioning radar system. That thing has a scanning range of over 200 miles, and even quite quickly seen from here in Portsmouth, but as far away as it looks in Paris. And in that range, you can monitor over 3,000 foot-sized objects travelling at speeds of up to Mach 3, which of course is three times the speed of sound. They can relay the information back in 3D to the clever computers on board, which can then prioritise their targets, and should a threat be detected, they can then launch off their own sea viper missiles, which are found inside the grey box you'll see up on the uh, front end of the warship. Now, other key weapons on board include the uh, white dome structure about halfway along the side here, that's known as the ship's block and fan close in weapon system or seaways, basically a high powered radar control gatling gun. Over the past couple of years, we've expanded the right to things to come and go. 
So nowadays, it's not just fresh fruit, it's also things like wind turbine blades and aggregate as well. Next door to Portico, then Portus International Port. It's often referred to as a cross shell ferry port, mainly because it's the second business in the country, the second to Dover. Alongside, we have uh, at least two of our cross shell ferries. Uh, the one back in alongside the Condor Ferry with the pink top there, uh, that comes across from the Channel Islands, so she's just come alongside. And then entered just in front of her is the Brittany Ferry, the Salamanca. Salamanca at the moment running a service between Portsmouth and Cherbourg. She's actually the largest and latest cross shell ferry run by Brittany Ferries. So she's uh, powered by uh, LNG, so basically she's far more economical. She carries, she's uh, designed to be a bit more efficient and able to run a little bit more efficiently. So that's her kind of new thing. She's also the largest ship they have weighing in at around 40,000. So as you leave the commercial port behind us, going back to the Royal Navy on our right, we now have the former HMS Bristol here, it's the only Bristol class destroyer to ever be built. That's because back in the 60s, Tuesday defence cuts, her three sister ships were all scrapped on paper. However, during her lifetime in the Navy, she was the escort to two of the aircraft carriers during the Falklands and was also the Hong Kong guard ship for a number of years. So, only days she eventually passed out for 15 years. Only days she was the friendship, which is what she was right up until the end of 2020. At the end of 2020, though, she was completely removed from the service. The laid up where you see her now is kind of waiting to be sold on for scrap. So folks, we're now going to be making our way down towards the gospel side of the harbour, so for this short part of the journey, I will leave you a piece from the commentary. If you have any questions, feel free to ask any member of the board. If not, just sit back, relax, and enjoy this part of the trip. I'll be to talk to you all very shortly. On our left, folks, great views once again of our two super carriers as we are slightly further away from them. Especially uh, as you are further away, you'll be able to see the top deck a touch clearer and you'll notice their twin island design. Currently, these are the only active aircraft carriers to have adopted the twin island design so far, and each island has its own unique role. So, for example, the one at the front with the ski ramp is the bridge, it's where they drive the ship from, it's where the captain is, the master ship as they sail all around the world. The item behind, however, the one with a sort of glass window surrounding the outside of it, well, that's an area known as FICO, or the Flight Control Centre. It basically acts a lot like air traffic control at an airport, guiding all the aircraft in and around the carrier itself. What's unique about this design is the roles are interchangeable. One of those items was to go down to lose power, for example. They can fairly easily and fairly quickly move everything to the other islands to remain fully operational. Therefore, given the slight advantage over the traditional single line design, we tend to see a lot of slightly older carriers. Now it's safe to say the glass ceiling elevator has never went. 
has since and has now been removed at a further cost of over £2 million. You can also travel from the bottom to the top. You just have to use a high speed elevator on the inside of one of the legs, and that takes just a matter of a few seconds to do so. Saturday, Sandown Gobble, the total height of 170 metres, making it the second tallest observation platform outside of London. So you have used nice clear day of about 26. But they proved to be so popular, carrying only 3 million people to and fro every single year. So the folks who have now gained permission to make a way back over to the port side of the harbour, as we swing round, coming into view up ahead of us, and seems to be on our right, we've got a great view on the harbour entrance itself. As you look through in the distance, uh, you'll see the shoreline, part of the lights, the town right, St. Helens, Beveridge, and CU. You'll also notice between ourselves and the Isle of Wight are three seat defence boards. These were built by a guy called Lord Harmston back in the Victorian era. They were done originally to help defend force of problem pending French invasion. Thankfully, the invasion never came and the force therefore no required. The one in the middle, Spitbank, was the only one to be open to the public. Back in 2009, three were more than the former owners of the of bed store. These were millions of pounds he converted two of them into luxury hotels. This meant right up until the first lockdown, you could have spent a night out of either Spitbank or No Man's Fort. Unfortunately, the forts have since closed. The other one's been up for sale. In fact, up until recently, you could have purchased all three for a combined total of about £10 million. Pounds. Come back inside the harbour entrance, you're in a right area called Old Portsmouth, often though referred to as the Spice Island. 